paraded, we've got the list of all of that, and it's all over the country. The problem has been that every year on infrastructure, you see an underspend of at least 43 billion rand. So sometimes it is not that we don't have the resources, it is just that, you know, and that's why we've changed the methodology of planning to incorporate project preparation to make sure that we de-risk the projects before they begin. But there are also attempts from National Treasury that the municipal infrastructure grant received by municipalities is sometimes used for everything else except maintenance and repairs. And there's now been an instruction from National Treasury that a minimum of 8% of the municipal infrastructure grant must be spent on maintenance of infrastructure. In terms of consequence management, that is where the Minister of Cocta must intervene, uh, the local provincial MECs must intervene. We are providing as ISA a supportive and a complementary help and service to the municipalities. Uh, and so we engage with them. And, and you know, you find also that they don't have engineers, they don't have the necessary professional skills within the municipality. And as ISA, we have built up some uh, um, skills in the built environment. We have, we have, for instance, last year established a technical advisory committee of all the kind of skills that you need within the built environment. And as and when we need any of those skills, we can call on them. And uh, uh, Dr. Ramahopa and Issa has also got skills. Yes, we still need a lot more skills. And then we also have got a number of people from skills from the private sector that, that is assisting us. So yes, municipalities is the first priority, but you are right. We do need to have that cooperation with the municipalities to guide them and to help them to deal with the failing uh, infrastructure in many towns across our country. I uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll now head over to the questions um, on our WhatsApp line. I'll ask that, um, Ignatius, if you can just read them out for us. Just read all of them. Minister and Dr. Ramkuba will note them and they will come answer all of them at once. Thanks, Nambalela. Um, the first questions come from Nogokanyam Damba from Chakaranda FM. Where will, where will the six, uh, uh, six trillion to implement the plan come from? Can we get a, a clearer breakdown of how much of these six trillion will be allocated and when? And then a second question from Nokokanya. Uh, Dr. Ramkoba talked at length about the four, four target, targeted sectors, such as uh, energy, water, uh, transport, and digital communications. But it all seems on a surface level. Can we get a better sense of how exactly the freight sector will be reformed um, and how how access to water and sanitation will be achieved and uh, and also how access to broad to broadband will be achieved and then the last question from Ukraine what mechani mechanism will be put in place to guard against ir irregular and wasteful expenditure of the funds allocated for the plan and then I have a question from Terence Krima from Engineering News. The NIP 2050 says that the, the integrated resource plan will be revised to extend to 2050. When will this be done and who will be responsible for the revision? And then the second question is from Terence Krima. What can ISA do to address the rate tape that is hindering the, res the registration of distributed generation uh, project with NERSA in line with the 100 um, megawatt reform. And the, the que that question from uh, Terence Krima, um, has ESCOM been consulted on the NIP 2050 plan to, okay, to reinforce core back revenues to to provide the necessary capital fund for future nuclear 
um, nuclear build program, what the impact be on ESCOM already dis on ESCOM's already distressed finances, and why can't new new nuclear, if possible, stand or fall on its own business case? And the last questions from. Uh, Maybe Omar, Omar let me Omar. just check the comfort. Can we carry on with the questions? You're noting them. All right, carry on. Okay, thanks, Jan. Uh, the last questions from Lamez Omaji from Fin24. Does the NIP address the issue of infrastructure budgets being underspent? Thanks, those only those questions for questions. now. Thank you. Shall we start with you, Dr. Ramkopa? Then uh, Minister Dilo will conclude for us. Thank you very much for those questions. There is a general concern I have all the time when you, you present something as long as you have presented myself and the minister. Is people lose interest in the process. So the fact that we have uh, such a number of questions it means a lot to me. So thank you very much for this. Uh, maybe just to, to, to make the point. So what the, the document does is to compute the total financing requirements to meet the objective of the NIP. And that's how we, we arrive at that figure of about uh, 6 trillion rand. And it doesn't follow that the 6 trillion rand is going to be allocated through the fiscal. So all of us know that uh, if it's an open secret, that uh, the fiscal matrix has deteriorated, the capacity for us to raise cheaper money in the debt capital market has been uh, significantly undermined. So the cost of raising money in the debt capital market is uh, it's getting to prohibitive uh, levels. So it is important that we, we get to, to also engage, uh, if you like, with uh, a new innovative uh, and financing models. And that's why Minister Delil makes the point that uh, the introduction of the infrastructure fund, what it attempts to do is to ensure that uh, we are able to de-risk uh, uh, projects, uh, ensure that the state takes the first, first loss and that uh, on the strength of state participation, we are able to crowd in and lock and uh, uh, unlock uh, private sector investment. I did make the point that we'll be coming back to you to share with you what is it that we'll do to finance social infrastructure because by definition, a lot of these social assets don't have a, a reliable and enduring revenue stream. And therefore it becomes very difficult for you uh, to, to raise money in the debt capital market when in fact, we don't have an underlying revenue stream. So we're working with the National Treasury, their proposals on the table, and I'm sure at the right time, they'll be communicated to everyone, through Minister of Finance and Minister Delay, on how we intend to address that uh, situation uh, going forward. Let me make the point that uh, we know that over, I think the MTF period, there's on average an allocation of uh, over, I, I think about 800 billion rand. So there's that allocation from the fiscal space, and then we're going to buttress it with the infrastructure fund and make sure that we raise uh, uh, money in the, in the debt capital market. And maybe whilst I'm there, just to raise, answer the question, the last one, how are you going to address the issue of uh, underspending? So having said all the kind of things I've said, the current problem that is confronting us now is not a financing problem. Because if you had a financing problem, it will mean that we should be able to spend all the allocations that we are getting from the fiscal. Minister Delil makes a valid point. We have done a longitudinal study. So essentially, it did a trend analysis over a period of time. The underspending in the public sector is about uh, 43 billion rents uh, per annum on average. And when I say public sector, I'm talking uh, national, provincial, local authorities, and SOGs. So I'm not sitting with a financing problem as we speak now, otherwise you could be spending uh, optimally on that. You shouldn't be experiencing levels of uh, 43 billion rent per annum on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the implementation, or if you like, uh, of those projects that have been financed. So the question is, what are you doing to address that? So there's a multiplicity of touch points that requires our attention. The first one is the capacity of the state. So essentially the, the degree and extent to which uh, we have both the engineering, the, the technical and financial engineering capacity in the state, one, to do bid specification, to do bid adjudication and evaluation. So you need that capacity. So in many instances, uh, it's not unheard of 
in government for a project to have gone out on tender for a period of uh, more than uh, 13 months. So you can see it's over a period of a uh, financial year, and that explains the kind of understanding. Then there are issues around the discipline of planning. So you find that there are projects that are attracting financing and funding, but this project don't have the minimum permitting and licensing requirements. For an example, you want to build a, a road or you want to build a hospital, but there's no necessary zoning from the municipality. There's not been zoned that piece of land for that purpose. And as we speak now, it takes an inordinate amount of time for us to do that uh, zoning. So part of the work that we are doing as say uh, what uh, in the context of what the president has announced uh, in addressing red tape is to ensure that we are able to address those uh, those uh, touch points. And then there are issues around the water use license, environmental impact assessments, that people go out, they attract funding for a particular project, uh, and then you find that those licensing requirements are, have not been met. And that's why the president has said we are bringing um, um, down the, the number of days that is required for you to obtain a water use license. So I think the ambition now is to go to 60 days. We have en ensured that we have engineered, if you like, the system uh, to, 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 to meet that requirement. I'm talking Department of Water and Sanitation. And then the environmental impact assessment is not unheard of to extend over a period of three years in, this inst in, in the country. In some instances, provinces like Gauteng have brought that within 30 days. So it's about learning and unlearning from those experiences and exporting them to throughout the country to address that. So in that way, you are going to address the uh, underspending. And of course, like Minister Dilida said, there has to be consequence uh, management. And then Nukukanya also asked the questions about the sectors, and I think the point uh, he or she is making is that perhaps we are addressing this uh, at a superficial level. I've tried to share with you in about 15 minutes a document that is over 60 pages. So we are very elaborate on what is it that uh, re requires uh, attention. I mean, on the freight uh, space, uh, uh, we're talking, I did make the, the point, and the Minister Bilil reiterates the point, that uh, we are introducing the Transnet Freight Rail will implement accounting and uh, commercial separation uh, to, to provide for a sound basis to, to evaluate and accommodate third party rail operators into the future. So Transnet has already articulated that third party uh, role players in that space. And then there are issues uh, around um, uh, uh, land ports, if you like, uh, working with uh, Transnet, part of the consideration, uh, the OR Tambo SEZ, there's issues around potential of the the pyramid here in Swani, we know that there's a Cato Ridge in the in the in the in the uh, uh, KZN. So essentially, these are staging points uh, to allow free capacity at the port, uh, so that there's a free, relatively free movement and access to the port, so that you don't have the kilometers and kilometers of trucks that are wait, waiting to access the port. So you are relieving that pressure, bring it much earlier in the in the network, and therefore you are able to to maximize the movement of goods. Of course, uh, in that instance, it's also about the capacity of the road, uh, uh, the entry, and you have seen Minister Dilila has indicated. There's about four packages of road projects that are happening there because uh, of the staging requirements and also using that to uh, deciding to get to, to the port of, uh, of Devon. So those are some of the, the, the practical things that uh, are happening. And then uh, Terence raises a uh, a number of uh, of uh, questions here. So the the first one is uh, the ERRP. So we we'll make the point that the ERRP has to to be revised. So the point we are making is that the the responsibility for the revision of the integrated resource plan sits with the MRE. So Minister Devil doesn't impose herself or doesn't usurp the powers of the MRE. But what NIP says is that there's a need for us for a uh, revision. I think what is on the table is to have it in intervals of either three to, to five years. But that's a conversation that needs to happen. And that's why we're not explicit on the frequency of those uh, revisions until the DMR is uh, comfortable on what is uh, what is realistic, uh, Terence, in, uh, in doing that. And then on uh, taking advantage of the 100 megawatt uh, dispensation um, and ensuring that NASA is able to accelerate that. So the president has announced uh, um, the, the, a team to address a red tape uh, led by Mr. Nkosi. And in fact, we had our inaugural meeting, I think, two days ago. And this is one of the key areas that uh, is uh, 
is receiving uh, attention because you have created a dispensation but the speed with which you are able to express that dispensation undermines the intentions of that dispensation so we're looking at what those bottlenecks are and i think that at the right time we, we should be able to announce like i said the red tape the person elite is in the office to to address that kind of situation and i, I think that's a the business case why you needed someone from if you like with the, the credentials of the uh, uh, the kind of that Mr. Nkosi has a, a business acumen, a different perspective, a different lens, almost uh, some degree of bias from a, a private sector perspective on some of these shortcomings. Of course, working with the team in the public sector will have a much more rounded approach on how we are going to, to resolve that. And then number three, in relation to uh, the, the Quebec, just say uh, isolating the revenues that are associated with that. One of the proposals we are making in relation to financing, just the, the, the reconfiguration of the financing ecosystem in the state is that we must introduce project finance. So what does project finance mean? Is that the strength of the project should not be undermined by the balance sheet of the project sponsor. And in this instance, as an example, it's, a, it's a ESCOM. We know that the ESCOM essentially is a, is a sovereign problem. So it's no more in, in just an isolated problem. It's a sovereign problem. So that's going to undermine the degree and extent to which you are able to package this uh, project. So we're advocating for that. Uh, and to what extent have we engaged with uh, um, ESCOM and the parties in this regard? The, the NIP is a product of consult extensive consultation, DMRE, DPE, and the uh, ESCOM has been part of this conversation. But whether this one will, be, will benefit from project finance pa uh, packaging is a conversation that we must have. So I don't have a an explicit answer whether yes or no, but all I'm saying is that at a generic level we are exploiting the, the possibility of uh, project finance so that projects stands on their own, on the strength of uh, their revenue streams and the risk associated with delivering that project. There must be a, a, an efficient allocation of risk between the players, the party that uh, has got the, 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 the best instruments to attend to that risk must be allocated that risk. So that's what the uh, project finance is about. So we're working on uh, on resolving that uh, problem uh, going into 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 the future. So we have responded to the issues of uh, underspending, like I said. I mean, we need to address the multiplicity of the touch point. So it's not, it's not just the uh, one issue, it's about the, the macro organization of the state, it's about the the techni technical and financial capability of the state. It's about the procurement processes in the state that uh, that requires the uh, attention going forward. Thank you. Uh, just to add on a few points, um, like Dr. Ramachopa explained that the red tape reduction unit is within the presidency uh, with a project called Bulindlela. What we have established to deal with the blockages and implementing of, of infrastructure is that we have established a, a committee that's chaired by Dr. Ramachopa consisting of all the director generals within the various departments. So if there's a blockage that's reported to us on an EIA, we're able to intervene. If there's a blockage in terms of issuing a water license, we're able to intervene. And we have been very successful with this uh, committee to, to, uh, to deal with, with the blockages. I must explain that the role that we are playing as Infrastructure South Africa our key focus and our, uh, first of all that we are responsible for is the implementation of the infrastructure investment plan to coordinate that, to look for the funding to, to, to implement these projects. Uh, all other infrastructure, uh, it is still the responsibility of the relevant implementing departments. But we are assisting overall all departments at all three spheres of government and the state-owned entities to change the way they used to do things, things by coming up with improvements and, and, and guiding them to the process to speed up inter, 
I mean, the implementation of infrastructure. So we, 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 we've got a, a sort of a bird's eye view of all infrastructure in the country uh, where we are asked and then we've established various infrastructure forms with the relevant provinces and uh, Dr. Ramakopa interact at all times with all nine provinces and those entities, investment entities, uh, in the office of the premiers. Just on the mechanism how to stop irregular and wasteful expenditure. Like I'm saying, the implementing departments, it is their responsibility to stop irregular and um, uh, wasteful expenditure. What we have suggested and said that departments must do is that they must get the services of a team that can do due diligence on every single infrastructure project so that you pick up um, any irregular expenditure before it happens. We've also said to all departments to put systems in place that can detect and that can prevent corruption. But we took it a step further by establishing an anti-corruption forum in the build environment consisting of civil society, the private sector and government, where we are monitoring uh, corruption and where people are able to report corruption to us. Uh, the composition of the anti-corruption forum consists of the SIU, the NPA, crime investigation, uh, people from the, the, the Justice Department, uh, and, and civil society corruption watch, they're all on there. So, so we are monitoring infrastructure in general in the country and where we pick up corruption and I give a quarterly update uh, to the public about corruption cases that were reported to us within the build environment and also corruption cases where the SIU is busy investigating. The, the Anti-Corruption Forum is chaired by Advocate Motibe himself and so I think in the next month we will give you a further update um, and monitoring the implementation of infrastructure and try and stop the corruption. Corruption is steals from the poor. Corruption is the cause of the delay of providing infrastructure to our people. People just look at infrastructure as hard infrastructure like buildings and cement and all of that. But in fact, infrastructure is more than that. Infrastructure is the lifeblood to service delivery. And, and yes, we are doing things differently now. Um, we are working closely with the private sector. We are trying to change the culture that why must all government projects be overrun? Always overrun over time for years. Always over budget. And so that is the systems that we are helping uh, the various departments to put in place to detect and prevent it. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister and Dr. Ram Kupa. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us. We've reached the end. Just to check one more time, Ignatius, there are no more questions. There are no more questions in the room. You're fine. No more questions in the room. This brings us to the end. I'll just make two announcements before we can all leave. Um, the first is that if you wish to arrange media interviews um, for Minister DeMille, please contact Zara Nicholson. Um, her contacts are on the media statement that has been circulated. If you wish to arrange media interviews for Dr. Ramukopa, please contact myself, Nungulelo Nyatela. My details are on the media statement. And just a final um, a uh, sort of uh, announcement for the people in the room. One of our colleagues has misplaced their Huawei P30 phone, a blue one. So if you've seen it anywhere on your desk, please just have a look and just hand it to myself or Ignatius um, if you've seen it. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for joining us.